All right, so good afternoon again. Um, first off, just as a reminder, you have your first homework due this Sunday. Um, so I, I saw already that a bunch of people have um, have uh, submitted it. How many people have uh, taken a look at it already? Looked at it. <laughs> uh, Storm, did you raise your hand? Did you have a question? That was just me raising, um, just like saying I looked at it and checked, like did see a problem. Okay. All right, good. Um, does anybody, before I get started, so does anybody have any questions about the homework? Um, Marissa, with the percentage, um, there's two ways you could do it. Uh, you could sum up the relative frequencies of the first three, <coughs> excuse me, of the first three um, cells right here and that, and then just change it to a percentage. That That's one way to do it. Or you could actually, you know, count the total frequencies here and divide it by 55. Because that's how many of them there are. Does that help at all? Does that make sense? Okay, good, good, good. I'm sorry, I just joined. Is there any way you could re-explain that? Sure, so you're talking about this question here, what percentage of signers? Oh no, never mind. Different question, never mind. Maybe you'll go over it later. Uh, and so I, I've got a couple minutes. I'm gonna go over the standard deviation today, Melissa. Yeah, it's gonna be like the first thing we do. Uh, does anybody else have any questions on the homework they want me to, to work? I have a question, Professor. Yeah, go ahead. Um, for relative, free, so I already did that chart, like for relative frequency, I got like a few odd numbers and even them like 0 0.4 and 0 0.31. So I set up the graph like 0 0.05, 0 0.010. Like, is that good? That's totally fine. So oh, okay. if you sketch it by hand, it's just going to be a total eyeball rough sketch. The only reason I have to do it just this once by hand is just so you can kind of get practice at it. But then, um, yeah, don't, don't stress about that. Any other questions anybody has? For the mean, median, and mode, can we just like look at that briefly? Just... Uh, this right here? Correct. Um, so before I answer this question here, um, why don't you give me until the end of class? Because um, I'm going to show you how to, um, how to use your calculator to find these things. Is that OK? OK. And then yeah, at the fine. end of class, just remind me um um yeah for the private message that was sent to me don't don't even worry about it don't don't stress you can come in and out as you need to uh don't even worry about it the video is recording so if you miss anything you can go back and watch it um okay and any other questions you guys have about at least on any of this stuff i hope i hope the this you know, the first two, three questions were, are, are pretty straightforward for you. All right, so then just a reminder, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to save the file and submit it to me through Blackboard. I do not accept anything via email. Uh, so just click on the assignment. Scroll down to wherever the file is, you know, whatever you have it saved as. This is something else. You just attach it, you know. You can write me a message if you want um, and then just hit submit and it'll go right to me, okay? And then I'll try to have these graded. They're due Sunday night. Um, yep, you can submit pictures, no problem. Yeah, go on ahead, Julia, what's your question? Um, so for the histogram, I just realized that I, uh, I made the chart based on the frequency, but it's supposed to be on the relative frequency numbers, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you already submit your assignment? No, I. But I counted by two, four, six, eight, and um, when someone said that they counted by the. Yeah. So just redo it. Okay. Just redo it. No big deal. Okay. So you just would go by like. The relative frequencies. You could go by whatever whatever scaling system you want. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. All right, and I'll try to grade these for you on Monday. Um, so just looking over at the syllabus real quick. Uh, what is today? Today's the fourth. Okay, today we're gonna get through box plots. We're actually not gonna get through scatter plots at all. 
I'll do that next week. Um, so next week we'll do correlation and regression. Uh, I'll also post homework number two for you early next week. So you can download it and take a look at it. Um, how many people have just out of curiosity, their TI graphing calculators with them today, either the TI 83 or the TI 84. I have the TI 84. Okay. Do other people, um, if you have them, all right, we're not going to use them immediately, but definitely like take them out. Okay. Um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna do some stuff by hand today, and I and unfortunately, I'm sorry. This this lecture is also a little dry. It's gonna be a lot of like menial calculations. Uh, I want to just show you how to do this stuff once by hand, just so you can understand the calculations that are going on, and then I'm gonna show you how to use either one of your graphing calculators. Doesn't matter if you have the TI83 or TI84. Doesn't matter. Okay. All right. So I believe where we were. Uh, last class was um, we were taught, we did this, we ended on this GPA example of a weighted mean. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. All right. So last class, just real quick. Hmm. Something is going on with my chat here. Sorry, uh, I'm just having a, like Zoom little issues here for some reason. Oh, let's see. Is everybody, uh, I'm sorry, I'm having some like uh, Zoom issues here every time I, click off the chat, it goes away. So just give me a second here. My, my, my apologies. I just want to try one thing. Sorry. You guys get to see my backdrop there. So um, you guys can still hear me, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, so I'm sorry. So what's going on is I'm having some issues with the chat box. It keeps disappearing. So if you guys could um, for the, um, I don't want to end the class and have it come back. Um, let me try this, see if this does it. Uh, I don't want to, um, uh, here we go. Now it's working. Never mind. I got it to work. We're good. All right. So last class we were looking at um, measures of central tendency. Okay. So we learned about uh, the mean, the median, and the mode. Okay, the big thing I want to just remember is there were two types of means. Okay, there was one that used this notation, and there was one that used this notation. So this first one here, when you see a Greek letter, what type of mean is this? Started with a P, if anybody remembers. Population. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, Jamie, in the chat there. Yep. Population mean. And this is a parameter, okay? And then does anybody remember what this one, X bar, what this one was for? It's a statistic, yep. But it, it, and a statistic means that is, this is the sample mean. Okay, so it comes from a sample. 
So just remember the subtle difference between a uh, parameter it comes from a population and a statistics comes from a sample because we're gonna, that subtle notation or subtle difference is going to um, come up later again in class. Okay, so what we wanna do today first, at least in the first, first hour of class, first 50 minutes, is we wanna talk about measures of dispersion. Okay, there's three main measures of dispersion we're gonna cover. The first one is called the range. How many people have heard of the range before? Yes. Okay, does anybody know just what the formula is for the range? Okay, it's, it's okay if you don't. Um, that's it, Melissa has it right there. It's the largest minus the smallest. So I'll talk a little bit more about the range. And then we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about these two things called the variance and the standard deviation. So maybe, maybe you've heard of these terms before, um, but uh, we're gonna we're gonna work with them in really in depth today. All right, so measures of dispersion. Um, so let me go back. I'm sorry. Measures of central tendency, as I said last class, look to describe the typical observation. And again, these were that mean, median, and mode. So what we want to do now is we want to look at how dispersed or spread out the data is. Okay, so what this helps us answer is a question like this, how typical is typical? So what that mean is, is how typical is your um, measure of central tendency? For example, suppose two students take a test. One student gets a 59 and one student gets a 61. What is the average test score there? Yep. Okay, so this measure of central tendency is typical for what people score. But what if two other students take a test and one person gets a 20 and one person gets a 100? What's the average? It's also 60. So this one here, um, you see they have the same mean, okay? But obviously this mean is not typical of what people score. Okay, so what we need is we need numerical measures to help us understand that. Okay, so this is the data sets we're gonna be working with today. Um, so just suppose, okay, just for fun, imagine that I called people in these two states, South Dakota and North Dakota, okay? And what I wanted to do is I wanna collect data on um, the average hourly wage of say uh, servers. Okay, of restaurant workers in South Dakota, North Dakota. Okay, so if you look here, um, the first thing I might want to do when I got these two data sets here is I might want to do like just a numerical summary of them. So, first thing is what is the average in each? Yep, Melissa has it perfectly right there. So the average here in South Dakota is $10 an hour for these restaurant workers. And the average in North Dakota is also $10 an hour. Okay, so they have the same mean, okay? But when you look at the data, okay, when you look at the data, does one state seem more spread out than the other? Like, does one state, does it look like the data values are like a little bit more dispersed? South Dakota. Yeah, yeah. If you look at South Dakota, right? Like, it looks like the wages are a lot more spread out than the wages in North Dakota. Okay, do, do we all agree with that? Okay. So wages in South Dakota are more spread out. Um, so what we don't want to do... Sorry, what does uh, South Dakota and North Dakota, uh, just state abbreviations for them. That's all. Um, just because uh, as we go through the class, I don't want to write South Dakota anymore or North Dakota. So I'll just put SD and ND. Um, so to go back, what I was saying is that I, I don't want to um, 
uh, just say, hey, South Dakota is more spread out. What we want to do is we want to put numerical measures to this spread. So that's the goal of our class here. Put numerical measures to spread. All right, so as I will say this, if you, um, we're gonna do a little bit of like writing notes by hand today, uh, some, some of these problems by hand. So if you haven't printed these out, take a second to write these wages down. And then when I go to work stuff out by hand, you should definitely, uh, definitely follow along with me, okay? And as people are copying, you guys hear my son in the background just having a grand old time. You guys hear him before, just out of curiosity. Yes. Yeah. His, his, yes, his grandmother's here. So he was having a really good time today. Poor guy's been stuck in the house with us for the last like four days, just us and my wife. So he's happy to have somebody different. Okay. All right, so these, these measures here that I'm gonna talk about, the range, the variance and standard deviation, these two are actually tied together. Are gonna have strengths and weaknesses and I'm gonna to touch uh, real briefly on those, especially for the range. Okay. So the first thing here is the range simply tells us the highest value in the data set minus the lowest. Okay, so the range is just equal to the max value subtract away the lowest value in the data set. So if you look back here in South Dakota, the highest wage was $15 an hour for restaurant workers, minus $5 an hour for restaurant workers, that range is 10. Okay, so all this showing here is that the max deviation, all right, in the data is a value of 10. That's it. The range in North Dakota, the highest value was 12 minus 9. The range is $3. That's it. Okay. And this is what we would expect. So we would expect the range to be larger in South Dakota versus North Dakota uh, because the values are more spread out. Okay, so um, I actually, I'm not even gonna do another example because it's just, the range is just the easiest calculation you'll do in this class. You just take the highest value in the data set and you subtract away the lowest, that's it. Uh, so here's some advantages, okay, about the range. Um, so it's like incredibly easy to calculate. Obviously it's just a subtraction problem. It's easy to understand, right, like going back the max difference or max deviation in, in salaries is, is $10 an hour here. Um, here might be some uses, usage of the range. Um, has anybody ever been in a car accident where the airbags have exploded? I'm just curious. I have. So if it makes you, unfortunately, yeah, I have. And I, and I hate to admit this, it was my fault too. Um, Oh my gosh, now that I think about it, I think I've done it twice. Yeah, maybe, and both were my fault. Anyways, yeah, you know, you're a young teenage, early 20 guy. Yeah, not my finest moments. But anyways, um, if you have ever been in a uh, car accident where the airbags have exploded, it's like super scary, okay? So here's, here's, here's the reason I reference this is here's a usage. Uh, so one use of the range might be like quality control where you have to set absolute minimum for safety standards. So for example, suppose engineers test five airbags to find out how long they take to inflate in a car accident. And, and if these are measured in seconds, okay, the first one takes 0.7 seconds, one takes 0.8 seconds, 0.95 seconds. If you look at that range, the range is a quarter of a second. So if you're in a, uh, car accident, do you think a quarter of a second could mean the difference between life and death? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So look, you got to get that range down. Okay, you got to bring that top value down. So that's the use of it. 
The thing is, though, um, the range is not very is not reported very often in serious data analysis. And the reason is, is that large or huge data sets often include outliers. And we're going to talk more about outliers later in class. All right. And outliers are just unusual and extreme in value. So for example, um, if you take the income of US workers, okay, people in the US, so the top end kerner in the data set might be, I should have changed this because this has changed. Might be Elon Musk, he's the top richest person in the world. And the bottom income burner might be a street vendor making $1 an hour. If you look at their range, it's such a huge number, it doesn't tell us anything. Okay, so oftentimes this range is not meaningful to capture the typical spread of data. Okay, so we need a better measure of dispersion. And that's where we come in and they're talking about the variance and then by extension, the standard deviation. All right. So measures of dispersion are meant to describe how spread the data is. Um, so what we look at here is we say, okay, what we want to see is how spread out data is from the center, okay, from the mean. So we introduced these calculations called the variance and the standard deviation. And what the variance is, and by extension, the standard deviation, you'll see in a little bit. The variance is based on the deviation about the mean. So this first calculation variance, what it does is it looks at how far, put that in quotation, how far data values are from the mean. So from the average. All right, so when you wanna look at how far data values are from the mean, we look at their difference. So it's gonna imply some type of subtraction a little bit. And this is where it gets a little, little hard or a little weird at first. Um, just like population and sample means, uh, we have population and sample variances. All right, so I'm going to put the formulas up for these and they might look a little daunting at first, but I promise you um, we'll do one by hand and I'll show you how to break it down and then I'll show you the calculator. Okay, so here are the formulas for the um, population variance, okay, and sample variance. So the population variance is denoted by this Greek letter here, okay? Does anybody remember what this Greek letter is? It starts with an S. Uh, that's the capital, Bertha. Um, so this right here, this is the Greek letter sigma. And this would be read as sigma squared, okay? So here's how you find the population variance, okay? You take the first value in the data set, okay? So whatever the first observation you have is, and you subtract away mu. And does anybody remember what mu was again? That was your population. The population mean, yeah. All right, so you're gonna, that's just gonna tell you how far the data value is. But then here's the thing you have to square it, okay? And I'll talk about why you square it in a, in a second on the next slide, okay? Then you add to it, you go to the next value in the data set, you subtract away the mean and you square it, all right? And you're gonna keep going until you get to the last value in the data set, you're gonna subtract away the mean and square it. Then you're gonna divide by capital N. And if you remember what capital N is, It's the population size, right? So how many observations there are in the population? All right, so this is shorthand. Um, and Bertha had this, this right here, give me one sec. Um, this right here, this sigma, this is the sum. So it's the sum of each individual x value minus the mean squared 
And then once you figure out what that sum is, you divide by capital N, all right? Does this formula look a little crazy? It looks. No, <laughs> it looks a little. So what I'm gonna do is I promise you we'll, we'll break this down and it'll be a pretty easy when we do it by hand. All right. So what this actually tells us here, okay, this is, this is where it gets a little weird. The variance tells us, it tells us the average deviation squared from the mean. Okay, so it tells us on average, how far our values squared from the mean. Okay. Now you look here, next you see the sample variance. Um, this is just denoted as S with this squared on it. This is literally called S squared. Okay, so whenever you see a Greek letter, it tells you that it's a parameter. Whenever you see a non-Greek letter, that tells you it's gonna be a statistics. And again, it's the same basic formula, just the notation is a little different, okay? So you're gonna take the first X value in the data set and you're gonna subtract away the sample mean. You're gonna square it. Then you're gonna to go to the next value in the data set. You're gonna subtract away the mean and square it. And then you're gonna keep going till you get to the last value in the data set. Subtract away the mean, square it. And then do you notice a subtle difference um, in the formulas here, like up here, you're dividing by N, but this is, this is pretty important. What are you dividing with down here by? Sample minus one. Yeah. So it's the sample size N minus one. So this is a, the, no, I'll come back to this in a second, but just let me go over here and write the shorthand of this. So it's the sum of each individual X value minus the mean squared divided by N minus one. Okay, this N minus one is what's called a degree of freedom. Or degree of freedoms, excuse me. And the technical definition of a degree of freedom, it means the first n minus one values are free to be whatever they want. And then the last value must be the value that forces the deviations to sum to zero, which is really weird, right? Um, so I wanna just real briefly with a kind of an example, and sometimes this works, sometimes this doesn't work, explain to you all why um, you need to divide by n minus one here. So I'm gonna turn on my camera for a second. Can you guys see me? Yes. Let me see. Yes. Have I told you guys, maybe it slipped in class. Have I told you guys how old I am? Not a day over 30. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so here's the thing. Um, take, a look at, take a look at me. And just by looking at me in the chat, um, guess how, write down how old you guys think I am. If you were to just see me, how old do you think I am? 38, 33, 32, 35, 30, 39, okay, 28, all right, appreciate that, 35, 33, I have a young face, right, or maybe it's my toys in the background, I don't know if you guys can see on my bookshelves here, that make me see. with you. Yeah, I'm a big Star Wars fan, anyways, um, I'm also a big Marvel fan. I got this sitting next to me, but anyway, so I'm, uh, I'm actually 39, believe it or not. Um, so the reason I did this is if you look back in the chat, um, most people had me in the early thirties, right? Like some people, some people had up there, but the reason I did this is, did you notice there was one person Well, someone said I was 30 and then was there one person who said, I look like I'm 28. Is that in there? Yeah. So one person said I was 28, okay? Um, so when you go to do a sample, 
um, it's very, you're not likely to sample um, outliers or extreme values. So generally what happens is when you take a sample, your sample underestimates the actual deviation of a data set. And so to correct for that, statisticians just divide by N minus one. Okay, they kind of inflate it a little bit because they realized, you know, if I were to take a random sample, I might not get these extreme values and thus I'll under, under uh, estimate the deviation. Okay. So we'll come back to these formulas um, when we do our first example. Um, okay, so why square? Okay, so squaring each difference makes them all positive. Um, and you'll see in our first example, if you actually don't square these values and you add up the deviations, uh, it's just going to sum to zero, okay? Because some values will be above the mean, some will be below the mean, and they'll actually cancel each other out. So you square them to make them all positive. Um, but when you square numbers, it makes the final answer really big. So, and remember, this variance tells us the average, devi the average um, deviation from the mean squared, sorry. So it tells you the average deviation squared from the mean. We don't want the squared. So unsquaring the variance by taking the square root is what we call the standard deviation. And this is a much more useful number. Okay, so the variance tells the average deviation squared from the mean, whereas the standard deviation tells you just the average deviation from the mean. All right, so all these formulas are, Okay, if you look here, they look a little bit daunting, but all you have to do to find the standard deviation is square root the variance. Okay, so this right here, this sigma by itself, this is what we call the population standard deviation and all you're doing is square rooting uh, the variance. When you see an S by yourself, S by itself, uh, this is just the sample standard deviation and it's just the square root of the variance. So all these formulas here, all right, all it is is just the square root of these right here, okay? So before I go on, let me go back to the, our data sets here. Where would the slides be in Blackboard to print them out? Um, Jamie, I'll show you when we go to break, um, but they're under course content. And Robert, that's okay. I hope you're okay. Um, but, and I'll go back and Jamie, I'll, uh, I'll show you right now real quick. Yeah, if you go back and under, under Blackboard, if you click on course content under week two, you can find we're on this slide, lecture number three. Okay. Yeah, no problem. All right, so measures of dispersion um, are meant to show how spread out data is, okay? So if you look at these two data sets, okay, um, which one should have a higher standard deviation? Which one standard deviation should be larger? Should the standard deviation in South Dakota be higher or should the standard deviation in North Dakota be higher than the other one? Yeah, thank you, Melissa. Yeah, so here's the deal. Uh, and Kenneth, thank you very much. Um, measures of dispersion are attempt to, to put a numerical value to the spread. So a larger measure of dispersion means the data is more spread out. So what's going on here is when we do these calculations by hand, the wages in South Dakota um, should have a higher standard deviation than the wages in North Dakota. All right, so let's take the South Dakota, five, seven, 11, 12, and 15. And let's find the variance and standard deviation for each of these, okay? And hopefully what we see that the standard deviation in South Dakota
is higher than North Dakota. Okay, so I encourage everybody for this example here to really follow along with me and, um, and work this one out by hand, okay? So we're gonna take South Dakota. And the wages were five, seven, 11, uh, was it 12 and 15? Yes. Okay, yeah, if I can go back, Alexander, where do you want me to go back to here? Is this good? Okay. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how to do these calculations by hand. Okay. And let me know when I can go on, Alexandra. So if you're gonna do this by hand, the first thing you need to find is the variance, okay? So let me ask you this. Do these wages look like a sample or a population set of data? Sample. Yeah, it's just a sample of five data. So you're gonna use the sample variance. And that formula is S squared is equal to, it's the sum of each X value minus the mean squared divided by N minus one. Um, how can you tell? So basically like uh, I, when I started, I said I took a sample of five data values uh, on exams and on your homework, it'll say you, I'll let you know, it'll either say this is a sample set of data or a population set of data, Jamie. It'll always be laid out for you. Okay, so to do this by hand, I'm gonna show you how to do this with a table. Okay, so you're gonna start your table and you're gonna create a column called X. And what this is gonna do is you're gonna list all your X values. Five, seven, 11, 12, and 15. Then you're gonna look in the formula. The first thing you need to do is you need to take each X value and subtract away the mean, X bar. Does anybody remember what the average salary or average wage was? 10. 10, yep. So look, you're just gonna walk through this. Okay, you're gonna take five minus 10. That gets you minus five. You're gonna take seven minus 10. That's gonna get you minus three. You're gonna take 11 minus 10. You're gonna get one. 12 minus 10 gets you two. And 15 minus 10 gets you five. Okay, just a very, very easy subtraction. Here's also why we square. If you were to just sum them up without squaring it, you'd get five minus eight minus seven minus five. They would actually sum to zero, right? All these numbers would cancel each other out. So this is why we take it in our last column here. We go X sub I minus X bar squared. So you're gonna take all these values you just found and square them. You're gonna take minus five squared, which gets you 25, right? Cause when you square, it becomes positive. Minus three squared gets you nine. One squared gets you one. I think two squared gets you four. And then five squared gets you back to 25. Okay, so look what I've done on the screen here. I've taken each X value, subtracted away the mean, and then squared it. What does this operator that I'm circling over uh, tell me to do again? The sum. Sum. The sum. Yep. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sum up all these values. Does anybody know what 25, 9, 1, 4, and 25 sum up to? It? Yep. Melissa, you got it. Sums up to 64. So look, this table with all these crazy calculations replaces this numerator. So the numerator is just 64. Now I have to divide by N minus one. Okay, so N is the sample size. So how many observations do I have here? Five. 
five. Yeah, five. So, so it's just five minus one. So it's 64 divided by four. I think that gets you 16. So that's the variance, okay? So how do I find the standard deviation then? You square root it, that's it. You square root S squared, you square root you just found. So the standard deviation S, uh, so the, the minus one is always given, Jamie, and the five is the sample size. So I have one, two, three, four, five observations. That's it. So the square, does anyone know what the square root of 16 is? Four. Four. And that's it. So that's what that's telling you. They're saying, look, the average deviation from the mean here is four. Wait, um, quick question. How do we get the four again? So, uh, which four, this four or this four? Uh, that four, yeah. Yeah, so it's always n minus one. So it's the sample size, which is there's five data values. So it's five minus one gets you four. Okay, I see it. Okay. Thank you. Could you go over the standard deviation again? How to do all this? Uh, just um, what you did on the right, the standard deviation. So yeah, all one. you do to find the standard deviation is just going back. All it is is the square root of the variance. That's it. So this crazy calculation with the table, the first thing I found was the variance, which was 16. And then the standard deviation is just the square root of it. Okay, so the square root of 16 is four. That's how I got this four here. So generally, um, it's, it's, so, it's so hard for me to do this remote because when I teach this in person, I can see everyone's faces and like, um, so let me, let me just ask you guys this and be honest, pretty terrible doing this by hand. Not fun. Not fun. Not fun. Okay. Not fun. <laughs> it's not bad. It's not bad. Right. I mean, it's just a, just a, it's just an algorithm you have to follow. Right. So look, I don't ever want to do this stuff by hand. And, and honestly, in the real world, nobody does this by hand. So everybody take out your, your graphing calculator, either the TI-84 or the, or the TI-83, okay? And I'm gonna show you all how to do this um, by hand, okay? So everybody turn their calculators on. And the first thing I want us all to do is to reset our calculators, okay? So to reset your calculators, it doesn't matter if it's a TI-84 or a TI-83, it's done the same way. So everybody, I'm just gonna do it on a TI-84, but if you have the TI-83, it's the same thing. You're gonna hit this second function option on your calculator. And you see this option on the screen, you see where my mouse is? Can everybody see where my mouse is? This MEM, it stands for memory. It's above the plus sign. So I went second function and then memory. And you should see this right here. Okay. People with me? How many people? Does anyone not see this? Okay. I see it. So we want option number seven. So that stands for reset. We're going to reset our calculator. So hit number seven. Didn't clear. I don't know what that means, Robert. So I went uh, second function and then memory right here. Okay. And then I want option number seven. So I'm gonna press the seven button. And that's gonna ask me what, what I wanna reset. I wanna hit option number one. I wanna reset all RAM. That's gonna literally clear everything out of your calculator. Okay, so hit one next. And then it's gonna say, wait a second, are you sure you wanna do this? And you're gonna go yes for number two to reset. And you should see something like this on your screen. Okay. Did anybody not follow that or does anyone need to see me do it again? Again? Yeah, no problem. So I went 
second function, this blue button on your calculator or a yellow on the TI-83. And I go down to memory. So I hit the plus sign. And then you're just gonna, on your calculator, just press the options in a row, seven, one, two. And you should see this. Okay. Good or not good, Robert? Okay. All right, so there's a button in this class we're gonna use a ton, okay? And being statistics, all right, there's this button called stat. So everybody on your calculator now hit the stat button, okay? And over here, I'll do it on the T83 too. And you should see three things up at the top here. You should see edit, calc, and tests, okay? This first option, edit, is how you input data into your calculator. Um, professor, I'm sorry to interrupt. I didn't see the stat. Uh, do you have a TI-83 or TI-84? 84. Yeah, do you see right where my mouse is? Oh, I got it, thank you. Yep, no problem, no problem. So edit is how you input data in your calculator, I'll show you that. Calculation is how you have your calculator do a lot of menial calculations for you, um, which we're gonna make a lot of use of this class and then all of next week. And then tests are some of the things we're going to end the class on when we get to uh, statistical inference. So everybody under edit, okay, everybody should have edit highlighted on their calculator. You want option number one to edit your list. Okay, so just press one. So over here, you should see one. Okay, and this is really, really important. The reason we want to reset our calculator is I want everyone to see L1 at the top here. Okay. L1. And now all you're going to do is you're going to take your data and you're going to input it into your calculator. So our data are, are these numbers, 5, 7, 11, 12, and 15. So you're going to put it, you're going to go 5, you're going to hit enter. 7, enter. 11, enter. 12, enter. 15, enter. Okay, it's the same thing over here. So five, seven, 11, 12, and 15. Okay, listen to me very, very carefully here. Suppose you made an error or something and you wanna clear your data out of your calculator, okay? You will take your little arrow key here and you will scroll to the top where it says L1 and never, 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 never hit the delete button, D-E-L, okay? You will hit clear and then enter. That's how you get data out, okay? So is everybody who has a calculator at least with me plugging it in? Okay. If you hit the... <laughs> Mm -hmm. I hope you didn't hit delete. If you hit delete, just restart your calculator, reset your calculator, um, and it should bring back L1, okay? Um, next, so we want to have our calculator um, do something for us, do this calculation. So everybody, once you have your data plugged in, everybody hit the stat button again. And you're going to scroll over to Cal. Okay, so scroll over to Calc. This option number one here, this one dash var stats, what that does is that gives you the descriptive statistics for the one variable you have plugged in. So under number one, just hit enter. Over here, you're gonna hit enter and you're gonna see something a little different, okay? On your TI-83, Whenever you see something like this, it says one bar stats, just hit enter again, just immediately hit enter. Okay. Over here on the TID4, it's a little bit, a little bit more advanced. It says, what list is your data in? That's why it says L1 there. So you're just going to scroll down to calculate. And you should see this right here. Okay. How many people have this on their screen?
I do. Uh, that's good, Robert. Um, so good. Let me let me just talk about what you're seeing here. Do you notice how on both calculators? Sure, you're gonna go stat, Alexandra. Which calculator do you have, Alexandra? 84. So you're just gonna go stat. You're gonna scroll over to calc under option number one. See how it's already highlighted? You're gonna hit enter and you're gonna scroll down to calculate. And you should see this. Are you good, Alexandra? Or do you want me to walk through it one more time? Okay. This is awesome. Like, look, what did we say the average was? X bar, it's saying it's 10. That's amazing. If you notice here, what you see next, you see this is the sum of the X values. This is the sum of the X values squared. Don't stress about that. Do you see this thing called S sub X and Sigma sub X right here on your calculator for both of them? So your calculator doesn't know if this is a sample or population set of data. So what it does is it gives you the sample standard deviation it also gives you the population standard deviation. It just says, look, I don't know which one it is, so I'll give you both, which is great. So if you look back here, what did I say the standard deviation was? Four, calculator, S sub X sample standard deviation, four. Very, a lot easier to have the calculator that's, do it. That's easier. Yeah, yeah, yes. Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> okay, well, um, Good news, bad news. Um, good news is you can just use your calculator for every single one of these. You never have to do this by hand again. Yes, the calculator, is, uh, especially next week. Next week, the calculator, we're gonna do one problem by hand and everybody will hate me and wanna withdraw from the class. And then I'll be like, okay, let me show you how to do the calculator. Um, so the good news is, is um, uh, you, you can have your calculator do it. The bad news is, is like the calculator doesn't tell you how to do any analysis of this or what the values mean. So you have to, you have to realize that yourself. Um, one other question for you here. Do you notice how your calculator does not give the variance? It only gives a standard deviation. Can anybody in the chat or, or on the mic tell me if I know the standard deviation, how I can find the variance? If you square root the variance to get the standard deviation, Yep, Melissa has it. If you take the standard deviation and square it, like if you take four and square it, you get 16, you get the variance, okay. All right, so just going back here. I'm sorry. We saw that South Dakota had a standard deviation of four, all right? Let me just on the TI-84, doesn't matter if you have the TI-83. Let me just real quickly run through and show you how to find with your calculator again, the weight, the standard deviation in North Dakota. All right, so again, it doesn't matter if you have a TI-83 or TI-84 here, okay? Everybody just hit the stat button. Under number one, we're gonna edit the list, edit. And uh, what I wanna do is I wanna clear this data out, okay? So I'm gonna to scroll to the top and what button do I press again? Clear and enter. Clear, yeah. then Never enter. Clear. Never hit the DEL button. Never hit delete, okay? Yeah. Um, so then I just have to input these values. So nine, 950, 10, 950, and then 12. Okay, right into my calculator. Then all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit the stat button. I'm gonna scroll over to calc. And under one dash bar stat, I'm gonna hit enter. I'm gonna scroll down to calculate. Can you slow down? Oh, sorry, Robert. Do you have a TI-84? Yeah, uh, can you go back to- Stat. Yeah, I hit stat and I'm on highlighted one edit. Yeah. No, no. Did you put the data into the calculator or no? Yes, I did. Great. Now hit on your arrow key right here over to calculate. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yep. Hit enter. 
Yep, and you see how this is important. You see how one is highlighted here? Just hit enter. And then you're gonna scroll down with your calculator again to hit calculate. And you should see something that looks like this. I have no idea. Yep, I got it, but I have no idea. Okay. Yeah. Don't worry, we're gonna get we're gonna practice with this a bunch. Mm -hmm. So you see S sub X, that right there is 1.17. That's the standard deviation for the wages in North Dakota. Which is what we thought, right? Like we said, wages are more spread out in South Dakota. So it should have a higher standard deviation. So I just wanna get through these slides really, really quickly. Um, and then we'll take our break for like only five minutes today, okay? So for now, is the calculator pretty easy? I mean, not easy, but is a calculator, you know, a lot better than doing this by hand for now? Yes. Okay. All right, good. And don't stress, we're going to get to practice this a bunch. And also one last thing, when you go to do your homework, um, I think at the start of class, somebody said, you know, how do I find the standard deviation? Uh, just use your calculator. Okay, you don't have to do this by hand on your homework, just, just use your calculator. All right, so just a few other things. Um, so suppose we have two data sets here, okay? Um, this is just talking about uh, different levels of standard deviation, right? Um, this is data set one, this is data set two. Here's, they both have a mean of 50, but if you look at data set one, this, the standard deviation is 7.4 and the standard, uh, standard deviation for data set two is 14.2. So what this means is the data for, for set two is more spread out, okay? But what does that look like? What do I mean when I say, hey, this data is more spread out? So this is what you can see here. These, these are dot plots of the two. This is data set one. And this is data set two. Uh, you can notice just looking at the dot plot, this data with the smaller standard deviation is more clumped together than this data set with the larger standard deviation, okay? That's, that's what's going on here, okay? So that's what's being implied by a larger standard deviation. The data is just more spread out, it's hanging out there, okay? So we've seen that a larger standard deviation means the data is more spread out, but like, oh, are there any practical uses for the standard deviation? Like, um, how can I use, you know, the standard deviation of 1.17 or how can I use the standard deviation of four? Like, do the numbers actually have any practical applications in the real world? And the answer is yes, we use this thing called the empirical rule, okay? <clears throat> and this is really important for any quantitative data set that is roughly bell-shaped distribution. So what a bell-shaped distribution means, as long as the data is normally distributed, Okay, it means it follows this bell curve shape, right? Where the histogram of the data looks like this. You know, just, just this bell shape, uniform symmetric shape, okay? You have these three properties. Um, and these properties will hold if the data is normally distributed, okay? So first, approximately 68% of observations will lie within one standard deviation on either side of the mean. So what that means is if you take the average and you subtract away one standard deviation, and you take the average and you add a standard deviation, 68% of observations should fall between those two numbers. You can go even further. Approximately 95% of observations will lie within two standard deviations on each side of the mean. So if you take the mean and you subtract two standard deviations, and you take the mean and you add two standard deviations to it, 95% of observations will fall between those two, okay? The third property, you can even go out to 99.7, lie within three standard deviations on each side. Um, that one, we won't talk about as much. It'll be property one and two will, will be the most useful. So let me just show you visually what this looks like. Um, 
if you have something that's normally distributed, okay, bell-shaped, and it's centered, symmetrics, when something's normally distributed, it's centered at the mean. If you take the mean and you subtract a standard deviation, you take a mean and you add a standard deviation, 68% of observations are gonna fall between this number and this number, okay? This will make more sense as we get later on in the class. Um, if you think about this as a curve and you have area under the curve, okay? 68% of the area under this curve falls between here and here. That's what this is also saying. You can go out 95. If you take X minus the mean, X minus two standard deviations and you take X plus two standard deviations, 95% of observations will fall in here. Okay. Uh, this will only hold for data that's normally distributed, okay? Uh, let me, how about I do uh, an example of this? Does that sound good? Yes. Okay, or how you could use this. Give me one second just to. How do you clay a calculator again? Um, one second. Okay. So to go back into your calculator, um, are you just talking about the data set? Yeah, to get to square one again. So go back to stat. Do you want do you want me to reset it or just clear the data? Clear clear the data. Don't yeah. just hit stat. Go to edit number one. Right. And then just go to the top L1 and hit clear and then enter. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Let me, let me, uh, I'm going to leave this slide here for you just on your own. I just want to do one more example of the empirical rule um, with data that might make more sense. Okay. Um, So you guys obviously know that I have a kid. And so um, <clears throat> I found this interesting. I don't, I don't know why. Um, really? but the uh, go on. I'm sorry, Robert, I cut you off. William. William, little William, little, little stinker, that guy. <laughs> um, the human gestation period um, is actually normally distributed. Okay, so, you know, how long it takes, you know, for William to, you know, bacon, it's normally distributed, um, which means that human gestation periods follow this bell curve, okay? So my son was about a week late, but um, let me give you some more data. So the mean human gestation period is 266 days and the standard deviation is 16 days, okay? So to use the empirical rule, you need, you need three things. You need to be told it's normally distributed or bell-shaped. You need this mean and the standard deviation. So here's the first question. 68% of gestation periods will be between what two values? All right, well, if you look back here at our empirical rule, what we're saying here is 68% of observations, we take the mean and you subtract one standard deviation and you take the mean and you add one more standard deviation. So look, you'll take the mean and you'll subtract a standard deviation and you'll take the mean and you'll add a standard deviation. So you're gonna take 266 minus 16, and you're gonna take 266 plus 16. Well, 266 minus 16, I think gets you 250. And 266 plus 16, does that get you 282? Did I do that right? Yeah, 
Yes. So this is what this is saying. Look, 68% of all human pregnancies, all right, are going to last between 250 days and 282 days. Let's expand on that. 95% of gestation periods will be between what two values? Well, look, all you're gonna have to do to go back, this is why the empirical rule is great. All it is is two standard deviations now. So you're gonna take the mean 266 and you're gonna subtract away two times the number of standard deviations or two times whatever the standard deviation is. And you're gonna to go to 266 plus two times the standard deviation. So it's gonna be 266 minus 32 and 266 plus 32. So it looks like it's 234 to 298. So this is what we're saying. 95% of gestation periods for humans are gonna last somewhere between 234 days and 298 days. So that's just a practical application of the standard deviation. And we're gonna use this empirical rule a ton a ton later on in class, uh, especially when we get to um, confidence intervals and hypothesis testing. Okay, I know I went over for our break. Um, at least, how about this? At least did the calculator stuff okay? Yes. Okay. All right, so what I wanna do, I'm gonna take, let's take a three minute break. Um, Let's start back at, we'll make it four minutes, okay? We'll start back at 2.12. Does that sound okay with everybody? Sounds good. All right, I'll be right back. See you in a couple minutes.
All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. Okay, so what I want to do um, real quickly um, with about the half an hour that we have left, 35 minutes, is I want to start this five number summary um, lecture. Um, we probably, um, whatever we don't finish on this, I will cover, pick up on next Tuesday. And then also, if you look back in the, um, uh, the course under course content uh, for week two, um, I'll finish up lecture number five at the start. That's real brief. And then I will open up this folder uh, early next week or over the weekend for you. I just got to change the dates and I'll open it up. Um, so let's start this. So this last part here is I got some good news. Um, this is going to be like the last lecture on um, numerical summary of data. Uh, and then after this next week, we're going to move on to um, more advanced and, and honestly what I think is more interesting topics. Okay, so this, this section here is called the five number summary for data. And so we were talking about um, measures of spread. So the measure of spread that's attached, before I get into this stuff here, the measure of spread that works with the mean was called the standard deviation that we saw. Okay, like the, the formula for the standard deviation had the mean in it. Well, what measure of spread works with the median? That's another really good measure of central tendency. Well, the measure of spread that goes with the median is, is what's called the interquartile range. So you're going to hear me call this interquartile range the IQR. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's generally a better measure of spread than, say, like the range. Okay, so the range is rarely ever reported. Um, because it's not affected by extreme outliers. And the interquartile range um, comes up a lot when we start talking about how to identify outliers in data sets and also how to construct what we call box and whisker plots or box plots. Okay, so there's a couple things here. So this interquartile range is a range of some type. So it's a subtraction problem. Inter means the inner part. And then there's this word quartile. Okay, so what we have to talk about next is before we even get to the interquartile range, um, we have to talk about what the quartiles for a data set are. So quartiles are really, really easy. Um, so what you're going to do is you're going to range data in this increasing order. Okay, next you're going to determine the median. Um, and then I'll get to that. And then after that, what you're going to do is you're going to take the data and you're going to divide it into two separate halves. So every data set has three quartiles. Okay, what we call the first quartile, the second quartile, and the third quartile. And they're just going to be denoted Q1, Q2, and Q3. We're going to do exactly one of these problems by hand. Okay, and then I'm going to show you how to do your calculator for this. And when we go to do this by hand, the second quartile is the one you'll find first. And all the second quartile is, it's actually the median of the entire data set. Another way to interpret the second quartile is 50% of observations are below it. And here's the thing why I think that makes sense is like um, when you think of quartile, you think of quarter and you think of 25%. So the second quartile equates to two quarters. So that would be 50%. After that, we'll find the first quartile. And all you're going to do if you're going to find the first quartile is it's the median of the bottom half of the data set. Okay, so what the first quartile is, is it's the value for which 25% of data is below it. Then what you'll do when we do this by hand is you'll find the third quartile and the third quartile is the median of the top half of data. 
So if the first quartile is the observation for which 25% of data is below it, the second quartile, 50% of data is below it, what's the third quartile? What percentage of data is below it? 75. That's it, that's it. So once you find the quartiles, you're able to find this thing called the interquartile range, okay, or this IQR. And all the IQR is, it's the difference between the first and third quartiles. Okay, so the IQR, as you can see here, I'm just going to rewrite it. It's just Q3, the third quartile, minus Q1. So what this number is, is it's the range of the middle 50% of data. That's what the IQR does. It says, okay, all right, let's just talk about the meat of the data, the middle 50% of data, and what is the range of that? That's what the IQR tells us. And that makes sense, right? Because when you look at Q3, 25 is above it. When you look at Q1, 25 is below it. So this is only that middle 50% of data. All right, and after you see one example of me doing this by hand, um, uh, it's really, really straightforward. So um, if you'll notice on the slides, if you have the slides printed out, um, uh, I have this first example here and you'll see that I have it like played out like this, but I'm actually gonna work it by hand in the slide. So I encourage you as I um, uh, go through the slides to find this stuff, you follow along in, in, in the example with me. Okay, I'm gonna go right to this. Once you have the quartiles for a data set, you can calculate what's called the five number summary or list the five number summary of a data set. And all the five number summary is, is it lists the first, second and third quartile and then the min and the max of it. Why we care about the five number summary is there's a very common statistical um, visual summary of data using it. So the visual summary that uses this is called a box plot. How many people have heard of box plot before? You might have also heard it as a box and whisker plot. No takers on them seen it before or heard of it? I never have. That's okay. So actually you probably have seen it, not realized it. Um, I'm just gonna skip ahead in the slides real quick. I know I'm going real fast, ignore the slides. But have you ever seen something that looks like this? Like maybe in the news or in the textbook somewhere? Yes. Yeah, that, this is a box plot. So you all have actually, believe it or not, you have all probably seen a box plot. Yep, you would have done it in Math 117. Yep, you would have all seen a box plot before. But now I'm just gonna show you where these calculations come from. And, that, and that's it. Okay, so let's just start. I just wanna do one example. Um, and then I'll show you how to use your calculator for the second example. Okay, so imagine you have this data set here. It's just a bunch of numbers, okay? 12, 6, 4, 9, 8, 4, 9, 8, 5, 9, 8, and 10. All right, and I wanna find the quartiles by hand. That's okay. I'm sorry if you're having internet problems. The, I'll, the recording for this will be posted later on today, though, too. So you'll be able to go back and, and see it. Yep. All right. So the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to order the data. Okay. So this is the data ordered. All right. So let's, I encourage you on a piece, whatever piece of paper you have, um, to, to write this data down and, and and follow along as I do this by hand this one time. So it looks like there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 observations. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Okay, so the first thing you have to do is you have to find Q2, okay? So you're gonna have to find the median. Okay, 
So I use this what's called n plus one divided by two position. So this is 12 plus one divided by two gets me 13 divided by two, which tells me the median occurs in position 6.5. So here's position one, two, three, four, five. Here's position six, here's position seven. That tells me the median is gonna occur right here. Okay, so what is the average of eight and eight? Well, it's right there, it's eight. Okay, so the median is eight here. So this is also Q2. So then what you're gonna do next is you're gonna cover up. Imagine that you cover up the top half of data and you look at the bottom half of data here. All right, can anybody tell me what the median of the bottom half of data is? Does anybody, can anybody like eyeball it and look at it? 5.5? Yep, thank you. Yep, it's, it's real easy, it's right here. It falls between five and six. So that means the first quartile is the number 5.5. Okay, so then cover up the bottom half of data, cover it up. When you look at the top half of data, okay, can anybody tell me what the, thank you Bertha, right there. Quartile three is gonna fall between these two numbers, nine and nine, and Q3 is just nine. And you can see this right here. Okay, I have it right there in the slides. The next thing we wanna calculate from this, <coughs> excuse me, is what's called the interquartile range. Okay, that's this red bar here. That's the range from this number to this number. So this interquartile range is just Q3 minus Q1. So nine minus five and a half, it just gets you three and a half. So that's just the, the range of the middle 50% of data. And that's, that's it right there. Okay, the next thing I wanna do is I wanna show you now how you take all this Q1, Q2, Q3, the interquartile range and use this going back real quick and use this five number summary to construct what's called this box plot here. Okay, so the first thing you're gonna do when you go to construct a box plot is you're gonna put a number line up, okay? And the number line is gonna to have to go from the lowest value in your data set to the highest value in your data set. And the first thing you're gonna do when you construct a box plot is you're gonna to go to quartile one, which was five and a half. And you're gonna put a vertical line like this, okay? Then you're gonna to go to quartile three, which was nine, and you're gonna put another vertical line. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna connect these like a box. Okay, and what you're seeing here is this number on the box plot represents the first quartile. This number on the box plot represents the third quartile. Then you're gonna to go to Q3, or excuse me, Q2, the median, and you're just gonna put another line right here. So this line over eight tells me that's quartile two. Okay, and what's really great is, is the width of this box, this width down here is the width is equal to the interquartile range. The next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna to go to the minimum value in your data set, the min, which is four, you're gonna draw another vertical line and then you're actually gonna connect it out with a bar like this. This is why it's sometimes called a box and whisker plot. Then you're gonna to go to your max value, which is 12. And you're gonna draw another vertical line and then you're gonna draw a horizontal line out to it like this. And so this box plot, what's really great about it is it tells you those five number summaries. This is, look, this is your minimum value. This is your first quartile, your second, your third, and your max value. What do you think, not too bad? Not too bad. Yep. And then you can see here I have the actual, I, I personally think my, my chicken scratch one is better than the one in the slides, but you can see it that way, okay? All right. Um, I did want to burn through that by hand because I, 
I do want to show you how to use your calculator for this next one. Okay. So let's do this one more time here. Okay. Um, so I want to take this data set here. Okay. The second example, six, three, nine, eight, four, 10, eight, four, 15, eight, and 10. And I want to show everybody how to use your calculator to find, this is what's great. Find the median, all the quartiles, use it to find the interquartile range. And then we're actually, this is where it's going to get really tough is we're actually going to have our calculator sketch the box plot for us. Okay. All right. So everybody grab your trusty calculator that never lets you down. Okay. Can either be your TI-83 or your TI-84, doesn't matter. Okay. And the first thing I want to do is I want to take this data and I want to put it into my calculator. Okay. So I forgot what button do I press first to put stuff into a calculator? Stat. Stat. And then under number one, I'm going to edit the list. Okay. So you're going to have to go to the top L1 and you're going to have to clear it out, whatever data you had in there. All right. So then let's all do this together. Six, three, nine, eight, four. You don't even have to put it in order in your calculator. That's what's great. 10, eight, four, 15, eight, and 10. Great. And then let's do the same thing in our TI-84, okay? Six, three, nine, eight, four, 15, eight, ten. Eight, four, 15, eight, and 10. Okay, does everybody hopefully, hopefully, does everybody have all the data plugged into their calculator under L1? I got one, yep, yep. Yes. Okay, great. So here's the thing. It's like, oh, doing stuff by hand is terrible. Let's, let's use our calculator to do it. I don't want to find the median by hand. I have to order the data, blah, blah, blah. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to hit the stat button on your calculator. All right, you're going to scroll over to calc. Scroll over to calc. And again, it's just number one. You just want the one dash bar stats. So it's the same thing we were doing before. So just under number one, just hit enter. So over here, just hit enter. TI 83 has a little bit easier. You're just going to hit enter again. TI 84, you're going to scroll down to calculate. And you should see something like this. How many people see this on the on your calculator so far? Melissa, great. Everybody else kind of see this? Yes. <clears throat> Do you notice how on your calculator it has this little arrow sign pointing down? What that means is there's more data there. Okay, more information. So on your calculator using the down arrow, just scroll down. And you should see these things right here. And what it tells you what it what literally gives you, it tells you the minimum value, your first quartile, your median, which is the same thing um, as the second quartile, your third quartile, and your max value. And look, they're all the same thing. So look, right here. The minimum value was uh, three. Quartile one was four. Quartile two is the same thing as the median, so that's eight. Quartile three right here is 10. And then it tells you the max value. I know I, sometimes I sound like I'm keep repeating myself, but um, is it a lot easier with the calculator just to do, 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 plug it in and get the answer right there? Can we go over that those steps on the calculator again, please? Yeah, of course. Do you, and you said you had a TI-84, right, Robert? 
Yes. Thank you. Yep, no problem. You're just going to hit stat. You're going to scroll mm -hmm. over to calc. Yeah, I'm trying to clear it here. Uh, did you not put in the data? Yeah, I, I did, but I'm trying to clear it or something. I got wrong numbers here. So generally, if your numbers look a little different than mine, um, but you still see output, your numbers are just different, right? No, I'm completely on a different set here. I would, all right, I'll, I'll do it some other time, I guess. What, what are the steps for this again? So what you're going to do is under stat, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to edit the list. So under number one, and you're going to input all the data. So it's just this data right here. Yeah. Good. And then once you do that, you're going to go stat. You're going to scroll over to calc. And then it's just one var stat. You're going to scroll down to calculate. And then you can just press the down button and you can see min, quartile one, quartile two, quartile three, and the max. That's it. Okay. So from this, um, we can calculate the interquartile range. Okay. So the interquartile range is just Q3 minus Q1. So it's just 10 minus four, which gets you six. And then, so your calculator doesn't give you the interquartile range, but it totally gives you the means to find it. All right, and now let's all together, trust me on this, let's all together, let's, um, let's draw the box plot by hand, okay? Because like on your next homework assignment, you're gonna have to do this by hand, okay? So what you're gonna do is you're gonna draw a number line And your number line has to go from the minimum value to the maximum value, okay? So three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, like that. Okay. You can also change the scaling. Like if you wanted to go by twos, it doesn't matter. Okay, the scaling doesn't matter here. I just went by every single one. Okay, so the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna go to Q1, which is four. You're gonna put a little box here. Then you're gonna go to Q3, which is 10. You're gonna put another little line. I think I said box, but I meant vertical line. And then you're gonna connect them to form the, the meet the box. Then you're gonna to go to Q2 where the median is and you're gonna draw a vertical line over the number eight. Then you're gonna go down to your minimum value, which was three. You're gonna put another little line and then you're gonna draw a horizontal line out to it. And then you're gonna to go to 15 and you're gonna draw the line right out to it this way. And that's how you construct a box plot or a box and whisker plot really, really quickly with your calculator doing everything but the graphing for you. All right, I know I went through that pretty fast, but was it um, not, at least the calculator part, not too bad? No, it's not bad. It's not bad, it's good. I have to practice. Uh, you know what? Yeah, uh, we, we all have to practice. Uh, don't worry. We're gonna, I'm just butting up against the end of class and I just want get, to get some stuff done. So I realize I'm going fast, but don't worry. Don't stress. Um, I'm just going to go forward a little bit. Obviously, my box pot looks better, but I'll come back for a second. But we're going to get some chance, especially on Tuesday. Uh, to do a lot more practicing of this. Okay, so don't stress too much, all right? Um, so Q2 in your calculator is the median. So when you look at your calculator, uh, where it says MED, median, that's just quartile two. That's all it is. Okay. 
All right, let me just um, talk about how box plots are useful. Um, okay, so box plots, instead of seeing just how the data is dispersed, it's really good for comparing uh, two or more data sets. Like if you look at the heights of boys and girls in middle school, you can just like infer from it that on average, it looks like the distribution of boys, their heights are taller than girls, okay? Uh, you can also use it to compare temperatures in cities, you know, Seattle, San Antonio, and New York, right? You know, you can just see Seattle is, blah, uh, you know, a little temperate, San Antonio is hot, New York is all over the place. Um, so it's really useful in that sense. Boxplot can also pick up skew in data. Um, so like when something is, when you have a right skewed data set, you'll see that in the box plot because you'll have this one of the, the one of the whiskers shooting out to the right. If it's symmetric, you'll see a very symmetric looking box plot. And then if it's left skewed again, you know, the box plot will pick that up. You'll see one, one whisker shoot off to the left. And in this case, you'll see it shoot off to the right. <clears throat> so the box plot can also pick that type of stuff up, which is, which is great. All right, um, here's what I wanna do. Um, we're gonna do outliers next class. Um, but what I want to do with the time left is I'm going to show you um, how to um, have your graphing calculator um, also construct a box plot for you. Because we're also going to use our calculators for um, uh, graphing in a little bit too. Okay, so what I want to do, if you have the TI-84, you should have your, your data put in. I'm, I'm going to just put the data in real quick in the TI-83. So How did you declare it again? You did uh, what? You did uh, I second, went second function memory, and then it's just 712. You okay. can just press 712 right in a row. Okay. So now what we're going to do with the time we have left is I'm going to show you how to use your graphing calculator to start constructing statistical plots. Um, and this involves changing some settings. So you have to pay very, very, very uh, close attention to this. Okay. So how many people have used their graphing calculator to graph like an equation of a line before? Just out of curiosity, Melissa has, okay. People have great, great. And that's okay if you haven't, not a big deal. So that you use this graph button on your calculator, like this graph, graph, you see on the TI-83 or TI-84 here, graph. But how you do statistical graphs is a little bit different. So your graphing calculator's default setting is not to do statistical graphs, okay? It's not, so we have to change a setting. So that everybody look on my screen and on your calculator here, do you see where my mouse is? Do you see this option here called stat plot? stat plot. And then over on the TI-83, it's right here in yellow, stat plot. Do people see that? Okay. Yes. All right, so you have to go to stat plot, you're going to have to hit second function, and then y equals second function, then stat plot. Second function, stat plot, and it should take you to this screen where it says stat plots. Okay, I got it. Good. Do you know, does everyone notice where it says plot one dot 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 off? That's what you should all see on your screen. Okay. What we have to do is we have to turn our stat plots on. Okay, so under number one, while it's highlighted, you're just going to hit enter. So over here, number one, you're going to hit enter. And you see how it has the off button highlighted, but it's blinking. Hey, hey, let's, you know, do you want to turn this, the plot on? So right here where it says on, you're just going to hit enter and it's gonna move it over to be on. So under number on here, you're just gonna hit enter. And then you see below it, it has all these different types of graphs. Okay, the first one that it has default selected to is a scatter plot. We don't want that. What we want is this one, I hope you guys can see my mouse. One, this one right here looks exactly like the box plots we were just doing. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to scroll down on your calculator, scroll over 
till you till you're highlighted on the box plot and hit enter. So over on this TI-83, you're going to go down, and then you're going to scroll over to the box plot and hit enter. Okay. Professor Matt, could you go back to where we get into this plot thing? The sure, function? sure, sure. No problem. So what you're going to do is you're going to hit second function, stat plot. So second function y equals. Second function. Okay, thank you. Yep, and then under number one, you're just gonna, you're gonna make sure it's turned on. I got it from there, yeah. Yep, good. And then you're just gonna select this. All right, so generally, okay, you have to have the data plugged in, which we do from the previous example. Okay, so when you want to see like a line in your calculator, what button do you press next? Okay, would you just press the graph button? So everybody press the graph button. You're going to see something that looks a little weird. Okay, so everybody just press graph. How many people see what I, I have on the screen here? Okay, Melissa, okay. So what's happening here, it, say that again, Robert? I have error. So generally what that means is, did you clear your calculator? Did you reset it? Yeah. I That's think. because you don't have the data plugged in anymore. Oh. All right. so, so you'll just have to go back and plug in the data. Okay. No problem. So right now your calculator is zoomed to the center of the Cartesian plane. So what we have to do is we have to, we have to center our graph around the stat. So everybody hit the zoom button on their calculator now. Zoom, zoom. So you can see it on the TI-84, um, but this is statistics class. So what zoom do you think we want? What option here? Episode nine. Yeah, we want a zoom stat. We want, we want to do the zoom for the statistical graph. So it's also number nine on the TI-83. If you scroll down, you can see it, zoom stat. So everybody just press, we want option number nine on our calculator. And hopefully you see this graph here. How many people, how many people have got that? See those graphs here, got it, good. Good, 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 good. So you'll notice here what's great is your, if you look at this, I'm gonna go back to mine for a second. This was mine by hand here. And this is what the calculator. I mean, obviously mine is a work of art and much better, but you can see that they're roughly the same. You know, it's got a little bit of a tail here, the short one here. There you go, that's what the stat plot button was for. We're gonna use it a lot in this class. Um, so that, that's how you use your graphing calculator to, to do this. So on your next homework assignment, you're gonna unfortunately have to do the um, plots by hand. Um, and, and submit them to me, but you can check your work on the calculator. You can be like, yeah, that, that box plot replicates the one I have here. So, so it's good. Okay, so resoundingly what I'm hearing from people is we just need more practice with this, right? Yes, more practice. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, let me. I cleared my data, so I got errors. I have to look at... Uh... So you'll get an error if you plug in your calculator. Let me stop the recording for a second. 